really gentle with yourself. Days after you do this kind of work, you're going to feel a little funny and out of your body. It's a good opportunity just to love yourself up, eat really good nutritious foods, don't watch too much TV. <laughs> really, try to not do any of our addictive stuff that we do in our society. Because what will happen is if we do all those things, the change that this afternoon was that, that got started can stop. We are being reprogrammed molecularly. When you take in new information, that's what starts to happen. We feel funny and uncomfortable when that starts to happen. That's why lots of people don't change. They don't put themselves in positions where they'll hear information that will do this process inside of them. Okay? So since we've opened this door, we want the door to stay open because who knows what else, in my opinion, because I, I believe in God. So who knows what else is God's going to put in our face to learn and know once we start opening these doors. Sometimes you open, like ten doors watch, you open them up and everything changes. Sometimes it doesn't have to be about demons. It actually has to do about change and growth and renewal and serendipity. So, you want to be nice and open, take nice deep breaths, and stretch. <coughs> if you feel comfortable, you can bend down, touch the ground. <coughs> wow, grandma can do that. I'm proud of myself. <sighs> and look at, look at the other folks in the room and smile at them and make eye contact. <laughs> And that's how we just thank ourselves, we thank our bodies. We feel grateful for our gift of life and so we keep on working on behalf of the children that we love, the children in our lives, to make children that we need. share some of their feelings and opinions and history on the, sub on the subject of genital integrity for children. Uh, what I'd love is that each one of you would take about five to seven minutes a piece to kind of talk about where you come from and what, you're, what you really would want parents and people to know about intactivism um, from your various different perspectives. So please introduce yourselves and share that and then we'll open it up for questions and conversation. You can start wherever you want. Whoever wants to go first, go first. Let's start at the end here. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Lloyd Schofield, and um, I don't know if you've heard my name, but a couple of years ago in San Francisco, we had an initiative to ban routine infant circumcision. Mm -hmm. uh, we got over 12,000 valid signatures. Um, we were limited in collecting the number of signatures only by our resources, not by the number of people who would, who would sign. I can tell you from looking at the names on the list, and we checked every single name to verify that it was a valid signature, we had an incredibly diverse group of people. Um, it's hard to tell by signatures their age or um, Sometimes you can tell their ethnicity, but not always. But um, uh, religiously, I recognize a lot of very uh, 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 I really, I'll just say I, I, I recognize a lot of Jewish names on our signatures. Um, so this um, religious diversity is not an issue. I find that it's an age differential that is really uh, what we're working up against um, as far as ensuring genital integrity for all children. Younger generations seem to pretty much get it. 
Of course, nothing is 100%. It's an older generation uh, type of thing, much more than it is religious. Um, of course, um, most, of, most Jews <coughs> have their child circumcised in the hospital, which has absolutely no religious significance. So Talking happy. about the ultra-Orthodox a little while ago, um, a lot of these people don't even want to do this to their child. There's, they are threatened. There is intense pressure. I did want to mention, um, going to the Mestizo, baby, it has just come to the attention of people, of, attention to the news media, a baby's dying from Mestizo. It's happened since the beginning of time. It's just being recognized now. It's just being kind of, sort of, addressed now. Um, the mayoral, this has been a contention, a uh, bone of contention with the mayoral race in New York City, and it, it's very, very distressing that uh, Susan Blank, who is uh, on the um, uh, a American Academy of Pediatric Circumcision Task Force, she's the head of the Circumcision Task Force, She's a Jewish woman. She's involved in this mestizo uh, uh, horror story. And um, she's one of the pers people uh, pushing, saying parents should just have to give a consent, sign a consent, a uh, form of consent to um, allow this to happen, saying, we know my ch your, your child can die, but um, uh, we recognize that. We're going to have to go ahead and do, do that. And, and this is the, the woman formulating the policy on circumcision. So uh, she's certainly not speaking as a doctor because a doctor's one um, main uh, duty is to protect the patient. And she's not doing that in her um, role as a physician, her role as a mother. And really when it comes down to it, leaders, whether they're religious, governmental, whatever kind of group. The base, most basic role of a leader is to protect the most <coughs> vulnerable, not to exploit them. So if we could just get every leader to do what they're supposed to do, no matter how you break down the group, racial, religious, governmental, whatever, we would end this problem immediately. Um, we work very hard trying to get the word out uh, on attacktivism. We try and use every message possible. As you can see from this very old film, uh, there's been discussion going on about this for a long time. There's been this discussion and, uh, uh, since this practice started, and it's evolved over the years, particularly religiously, from drawing a drop of blood to just this tiny slice to a piece of flesh to what is now the correct term for what happens in this country now, medically or religiously, is ra um, radical circumcision. So it's evolved. Um, if we, we have to address this for, from all angles, it's very important to talk to people on one-on-one. That is how they get it. People do have to have a bit of an open mind and be willing to listen, and some people are not. Um, and we cannot let that be the end of the conversation because nothing changes if we don't take it a step further. So everybody has got to address this in their own way, but we... We, we can't let the conversation end just because some people are in denial, don't want to talk about it, um, or, or don't want to face the issue, because it will never be solved. You, you, uh, you know, I, I was very impressed seeing this very old film with Dr. Spock, how forthright everybody was talking about how these medical issues were phony, and uh, we're really not allowed to have that conversation today, except on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It's really not allowed in the media. So we've really fallen back. Um, <coughs> you know, again, religiously, in the, in the mid-1800s, uh, Council of Rabbis got together and said, hey, we don't want to do this anymore. They voted against, uh, they voted to stop circumcision. And we could see how that happened. Mm -hmm. So our perspective is a, 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 a from the long-term perspective, and 
perhaps some people think we're too vocal, but we are so afraid to uh, let this um, conversation just stop at an intellectual level and not make anybody uncomfortable because we're, we're, we're very concerned that we won't get anywhere and it will never be resolved. So um, I just want you to consider that aspect of this issue also um, and really um, stand up for children, uh, people who, they are people, they're human beings who cannot stand up for themselves. And when you look at it from the point of the injured human being, they've been let down by their parents who are supposed to look for the best interest. They were looked down, let down by the medical uh, establishment who's, uh, they were, whose patient they were, and they were let down by their government. And if you're Jewish or Muslim, they were let down by their religious leaders. Yeah. So you can see the impact this would psychologically make uh, on on. You know, from the, from the very beginning, uh, uh, when a child or young uh, person reckon, realizes what's been done to them, they've been let down by everybody who's been there to um, to uh, protect them. And we realize it's not the intention of people, but um, we have to get back past intentions. We're not trying to make anybody feel guilty. Uh, we're not trying to, you know, you. You know better, you do better, but we have to get past the point that, well, just because you had a good intention or good reason, then that's enough to let it kind of slide because it, it's not, it, things will not change if we, if we keep with that mindset. And thank you for all being here, and I'm very excited to be here and learn something else. Thank you. Everyone, uh, my name is Jonathan Conti. I am one of the events coordinators for Bay Area Intactivists. For those of you who are unaware, Bay Area Intactivists is a local human rights group uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we are working to stop all forms of forced genital cutting, both uh, male, female, and also intersex uh, genital cutting practices for those who cannot consent. Um, I am a victim of genital mutilation. Uh, this is something that was done to me um, as just part of our cultural practice, not for religious reasons. And as a, as a young man, as a boy, um, no one ever sat down with me and said, you know, when you were a baby, part of your penis was cut off. And this was never explained to me. Um, I grew up thinking that the way that my body looked and felt and worked was normal. Uh, and it was only um, until I was maybe 15 or 16 years old that I learned what had been done to me. And, and what had been taken away from me, both in the physical sense, but also uh, in, in the sexual sense. That part of my sexuality uh, had been taken not just from me, but from my partners as well. Uh, this was something that hit me very hard uh, in high school. It was very difficult for me to grapple with this. I couldn't talk about this with anyone. It made me feel uh, both very ashamed and very depressed, very angry, very um, upset. Um, I felt betrayed, I felt hurt, I felt that those in my life who should have protected me from this heinous thing uh, had allowed this to happen to me. Um, and this is something that I kept bottled up inside for many, many years. Uh, I grew up in Florida and I actually moved out to San Francisco about four years ago. And it was only once I moved out here that I was able to get involved with uh, a group advocating for genital autonomy. And, and so um, that afforded me the opportunity to join this fight and to, to speak out against this, this heinous thing that's happening uh, to, to um, our babies. Um, I'm very proud to have worked with Lloyd on the SFMGM bill. I was um, on the committee of uh, opposing forced male circumcision, and I was one of the signature gatherers in, in San Number Francisco. one signature gatherer. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, even though this ballot initiative uh, was never on the ballot for people to vote, it qualified and then was removed from the ballot, um, I'm very happy to have been uh, involved in this effort, which I feel like was a catalyst in that it brought circumcision 
uh, to the forefront for perhaps one of the first times on an international level. Now that you know we had people in San Francisco working to stop forced circumcision, we started to see uh, the press, not just in the United States, but in many other countries, start to discuss this issue. And, um, and the fact that while girls in many countries are protected from forced genital cutting, boys and intersex children continue to be denied um, equal rights. So I'm very happy to have uh, been involved with that. And uh, so I'll pass it on. Right. Hello, everybody. You must forgive me. I just finished a 12 hour shift. <laughs> uh, my name is Tor Spinner. I'm an RN at Alta Bates, and I work in labor and delivery. So I see babies being born of all kinds every day. Um, and it's been crazy busy lately. I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but we've had eight, ten, twelve babies a shift. What? Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> so. Um, I'm uh, also a mother. I have two children. I have a daughter who's 19 and a son who's 15. And of course, they're both intact. Um, because I grew up in Michigan, which is one of the highest circumcising states in the country. It's second only to West Virginia. Um, and my brother is 10 years younger than I. Um, and he was born in 71. Um, and uh, he was left intact because my mother was an intactivist before we knew what that was because she said don't touch my baby because yeah. you know back in the 60s and 70s they just used to routinely do circumcisions they didn't ask for consent they didn't ask for permission they just took the baby and a lot of times before the mother even saw the baby they were circumcised. Um, and of course that has changed because more and more parents have said no to circumcision of their infants and have um, demanded consents. And then if a hospital is sued often enough, they will definitely have consent on the chart. But then I also hear of hospitals pushing the consents on parents. Um, oh, you need to sign this. You need to sign this now. Or they give it to you with all your other paperwork when you come in and labor. And you're just signing everything. And so, you know, they take your baby away um, and circumcise him. And then he comes back and you're like, but I didn't want that done. But you signed the consent. So a lot of my job is around um, making people aware of their choices and um, having them know that they always have choices when it comes to having a baby, and especially in a hospital as busy as, or as large as um, Altivates. Um, because, you know, we do 600 births a month. Wow. And, you know, I tell parents all the time, you have the option to say no to anything. Uh, a lot of people don't feel that they have that power to say no to a doctor, or to a nurse, or even to a social worker, or the admitting staff. You know, they, they don't feel that they have that power, but they do. So that's one of my jobs, is to be an advocate for my patients, and that includes babies. So I, can, I can't tell you how many times I've been called into my manager's office. Tora, you cannot talk to parents about not circumcising their sons. Why not? That is part of my job. My job is to advocate for this baby who cannot advocate for himself. And there is no medical organization in the world that supports infant circumcision. And the only reason we still do it in the hospital is because they make money. It always comes down to money. You know, a doctor can make anywhere from $200 to $1,000 per circumcision. And it takes them 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes to do one. And if you line up four to five a day, just think how much money that is making for them. Yeah. 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 I've seen. That's true about so many things in medicine. Right. You know, all of it. Right. Yeah. 
I worked in San Francisco where the obstetricians do the circumcisions. So I've seen the baby be born, and a moment later the doctor who delivered the baby say, oh, do you want him circumcised? Because they're the ones who are going to make the money. While at Alta Bates, the pediatricians do the circumcisions. So we have about a 10% circumcision rate, mm -hmm. while at CPMC in San Francisco, there's more like 40%. Mm -hmm. Just because the different doctor who does the procedure. And they do it while the baby is there, after they check the patient's insurance. Because, I don't know if you know this, but Medi-Cal right. does not Doesn't pay for, for circumcision. <coughs> They stopped paying for circumcision in 19... It's a great thing. Well, yeah. uh, Medicaid dropped it in 81 in California. I'm not sure about Medicaid. Well, this is yeah. the same thing. Yeah. So, you know, it depends on where you have your baby. Mm -hmm. um, and Kaiser, because their leader of pediatrics is a big circumciser, a Jewish doctor. You know, you got to look at the bias here. You know, how can you correlate your medicine with your religion? Because people who are not of your religion, why are you recommending circumcision to them? So, so Kaiser is a big circumcising culture just because of that's how they've done it for the last few years. Mm -hmm. And you would think because they want to save money, they would stop circumcising babies. Because one of the other problems that comes with circumcising a newborn whose penis is small and you really can't tell how much penis you're circumcising, how much you're taking away, um, there's more complications and revisions in those babies. So urologists, pediatric urologists, see those babies when something doesn't go quite right or they don't take as much of the foreskin as they wanted or they took too much of the penis. So there is one, there's a pediatric urologist, he says that a quarter of his business is repairing circumcision problems. Or, you know, I've had parents say, oh, my baby had a complication with his circumcision, so he has to have it redone. Did you not learn the first time? <laughs> <laughs> or they'll circumcise their second son after their first son had a problem. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. So, you know, it, it's all about education and information. We need to talk to parents about what they're consenting to do to their child. And, you know, my big thing is, I have a, in fact, I have a Facebook page that says, Children are circumcised because they can't say no. If you held down a grown man and tried to cut off part of his penis, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> it would not happen. The only reason we do it to babies is because they can't stop us. Mm -hmm. So that's why we need to talk to people about the genital autonomy. People, the children deserve to have all their body parts to grow up with and to make decisions about themselves. But, you know, so many of the things that Tori just said are exactly the same types of work we're doing, the same issue um, for intersex people, you know. It's about education. It's about money of not wanting to stop this huge field of medicine. You know, because those surgeries are much more expensive oh, than circumcisions. You know, doctors are making thousands and they specialize. So it doesn't behoove them to just turn around and say, oh, we were wrong. Yeah. I'll go study yeah. something else for eight years. You right, know, right, we'll shut right. down this whole ward of the hospital. We'll, you know, so, right. so, you know, a lot of times I've had people say when they find out, or, you know, even a, a gay man who works for the U.S. government who I was trying to connect with on the issue, after hearing what his response was, well, th this seems like a medical issue. Shouldn't you be talking to the doctors? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in which, and I explained, I said, you know, we have been doing that. But as you can imagine, they don't want to listen. And it's because of this financial issue. You know, that there's issues that are way less contentious, you know, and obviously stressful than, than having a baby that can't easily be defined as male or female, right? That still get promoted and pushed because of money. So just imagine 
you know, what we're up against here. Just why, so the focus of my group, which I'm glad you put that out, which I didn't get to say, and I'll just say that quickly, <coughs> is um, what we do is mainly focus on education, on lobbying with human rights groups, not with the medical community specifically, because we know that's a very, you know, um, there's huge challenges built within that. And one of the successes we've had is last year, you know, I, I authored the first um, international call for human rights for intersex people. That's actually ever happened. It was signed by almost every intersex organization in the world because we were all meeting in Stockholm um, for this conference and um, over do two dozen organizations. And, you know, it was interesting because I didn't start off, I'm a writer and, and this wasn't my natural line of work lobbying you know, the UN and politicians and the US State Department. It seemed honestly very intimidating, right? But I was like watching what some of my colleagues were doing in Australia and like talking to them. And it's like, okay, you know, I can do this. So I authored this letter, found out through the group I was working with, you know, who to send it to. And this year, so not only have we been in correspondence all year, not only did they include intersex people, in their campaign, this is the UN Human Rights Office, and they launched a campaign over the summer called Free and Equal for LGBT equality and human rights. Right? Most of the world outside the US, it's actually LGBTI. The I has been added for intersex. And the US is lagging and kind of not wanting to be inclusive, I know, right? And, you know, the argument is, well, it's not an orientation issue. Well, neither is T, right? Trans is not about sexual orientation. And yet it has benefited the trans community so much to work in coalition, right? And the reason we are discriminated against is completely linked to homophobia. You know, I mean, I've read all the articles. There's this fear that because our very bodies don't conform to the typical sex and gender norms that we are going to grow up to be LGB or T. Like, that's the fear that drives the surgery, right? And then there's, and, but the myth around it is so many of the people who have come out to complain about the surgery are lesbian or gay. So it really is like a myth, a presumption, like, well, if we just change the body and cut it up and make it normal, then they won't be, you know, different. They won't be queer. And it's like, guess what? That is just completely false. And so, and yet, because of the strength of this cultural idea, they just are not listening to evidence. So we work with the Human Rights um, uh, Office of the UN, um, and they're beginning to be inclusive. They included us and allowed me to draft the definition of intersex in their campaign. And um, we've also been lobbying with other groups all around the world. Um, been getting a lot of media attention because what I know from being a part of a, a lot of different marginalized communities is it's the education, right? If society doesn't support a law, the law will be overturned. Right? Even if it somehow manages to go through, you know, and, and that's what's happening now with reproductive rights for women, right? It's like the Christian right is gaining all the strength, and even though Roe versus Wade has existed for a long time, there's actually this incredible move to overturn it. Because enough people are like, well, we don't agree with this culturally, so we, so we are moving to just, you know, and to support intersex people, a lot of what we do is peer support, to come out. Right? Because... People should know about us more than trans people when you think about the statistics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have existed since the dawn of time mm -hmm. right? is not a new thing, right? One doctor I, I debated with said, well, you know, people, society can't accept people of different colors. Now we're supposed to accept people, <laughs> right, I know. Now we're supposed to accept people whose genitals don't match what gender they are. I do not believe society is ready for it. And I was wow. like, ready for what? Ready? Well, we're not a new invention. This is not cloning or something. <laughs> it's like, well, well, we're not ready to go to the space. Like, we have always existed. <laughs> ready? Right? And so this is the, you so know, no, the he's extreme. got to put that as you. I am not ready to accept that. Yeah, exactly. 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 I don't accept people of different colors, so how can I imagine? Right. Exactly. Right. But I like that he said it. Because I really love that he said it because it allows me to demonstrate, you know, how it really is full-on prejudice. 
so, so that's, that's our work, to, to combat this by making intersex more visible. This is the first step. Okay. So thank you, everybody. I just want to say, I'm still some Sara. And I'm here as a moderator, but I'm also here as a birth worker and educator. And I think that one of the things that's really important, and an important role that specifically doulas and childbirth educators play, is that we can really help parents with expanding this dialogue and moving beyond just male and female. We all are attached to that. And, you know, big old matriarch, that's me. <laughs> but I think part of us, the part of us being an intelligent and wise matriarch is, is seeing clearly and seeing broadly. And I speak a lot with parents around, uh, especially African American parents, talking about reclaiming our culture. And in earth-based cultures, uh, intersex people are, are, are no surprise. There is a place for them. There has been historically a place for them. And it's not a place of disrespect. As we touched on earlier, the folks are a shaman. And those folks are, are welcomed. And there's a, they're a challenge to the community. They're there to challenge the community to, to think broadly. So when we're talking to parents, we get to have the opportunity to talk to them about what if you had an intersex child? Okay? My doulas, we're the only doulas, I'm very proud to say that, we're the only ones who, it's part of your training to have the conversation, what, are you going to circumcise your son and why? And to begin that, thinking on the parents' part, sitting the parents down and showing them, if, if as a doula, if my families want to circumcise their son, they're going to have to see a video, and then we'll see how that goes after they see the video. And nine times out of ten, the kid does not get cut. I've, I've even had families go right into the mom and dad, are have, they have to duke it out. You give them the information, you hold your breath, you say your prayers, you talk to everybody, they get mad, they have a fight, dad sleeps on the couch, you know, whatever they have to do as a family, because this is hard. And I, and I also want to have respect for what that, those people have to go through, because they've been lied to, and the daddy is a sexual abuse survivor. So if the daddy's been cut, he's a sexual abuse survivor, and that can't be diminished. Sexual abuse survivors, sexual abuse survivors do things that look really assholy to the rest of us, and we could judge that, but that's not helping to heal the situation. So he's going to have his response. Mom's going to have her response. You're giving them the information. You're kind of setting a container. I've had families get right down to, okay, the mom's like, okay, well, if you're going to have this done, then you take the baby and have the dad get all the way down to the pediatrician's office before he breaks down in tears and the baby will have the baby home intact. Judging and shaming and blaming and getting angry at this family does not make the, let them go through that process. And they have to go through that process for that kid to get saved and come home. home. So we have to, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge intactivist. Um, I'm a huge, I'm an incest survivor myself, so I'm all about no one hurting anybody else's body, and I'm all about people, you need to have permission before you do anything to anybody else's body. And I'm also a counselor, and I'm also a minister, and I also know that, you know, we are all just walking asleep in this culture so deeply, we've all been wounded so badly. And if we want to be agents of change for each other, um, you know, Finesse is needed. <laughs> and finesse is needed and our own self-healing is really needed. So we can be create that clear container that I was talking about earlier when we were being doulas and birth workers. Create a container where this family can rise to their highest good. And I see it happen more than not. Literally, nine, nine out of ten. And I've been a doula for oh, pushing 30 years now. No, actually, 30 years. This, this fall. Thank you. You can applaud that. <laughs> and so I'm proud of it. And I'm, I'm very, very proud about the fact that so many of the little boys in question don't get circumcised. And we, the, the, every baby not circumcised is a triumph. Every baby not circumcised is a triumph. And if we're all doing that with that clear attention, then that's a lot of little boys not getting hurt anymore. And that results in women and children in the future being safe too because when we wound our little boys we make this culture the unsafe place that it is yeah.
So along those lines, I want to open it up now. Let us talk with one another. Any questions or feelings? Yes. I just want to say about everyone, everyone sharing their experiences and the knowledge that they have and their wisdom uh, as a young person is, is so inspiring. Uh, and I fall deeper in love with this work every time I hear you speak. So thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, it's not a difficult concept to get. It's really pretty basic. We all have it in us. We just have to access that, know, go into ourselves and know what's right. It's there. And, and, and um, question what we've been taught. And that's the most important thing. When you do that, it comes pretty quick. Once the cycle is bro broken, particularly once, once these boys have been left intact and have not been sexually uh, abused, um, the cycle is going to get And very, very quickly, we're going to speak up as um, strongly as we can and break the cycle. And once it's broken, save as many uh, babies as we can and uh, keep it from being repeated. Um, do they still sell women's support skin as skin graft material? They sell it as skin grafts for cosmetics. Oprah's skin cream is made from foreskin fibroblasts. Uh, it's used in product testing, you know, not tested on animals. Um, just, uh, it, it's so prevalent. I mean, this is a, this is a billion dollar a year industry. If you Google foreskin fibroblast, you can see, they can be, they're harvested by race. You can order them by race. Um, it, it's a huge, huge, huge business. There was just some, some articles lately uh, about baldness cures, and they're using foreskins because they're so available and so cheap uh, for uh, growing hair follicles to cure baldness. So it's a, pan, it's a, it's a bonanza for the pharmaceutical industry. I just want to add to that, just so there's clarity, this is not 100% of the time, but the harvesting is occurring here in the United States to this day. In the Bay Area, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, and it's even just, um, you can buy a, a vial uh, of cells for research. I'm not certain what exactly the research would be for, but you can very easily go on the internet and buy a vial of neonatal foreskin for three to four hundred dollars for, for one of these vials. So uh, if that doesn't scream human rights violation, I don't know what does. Right. Mm. Yeah. I think that could be a platform that, you know, I mean, I'm sure you guys do already, but that could be a platform for all of us to speak to. Industry. We're yeah. just supporting an industry. Unfortunately, what we were up against is, you know, we're talking about men being victimized. What happens is they're laughed at, they're ridiculed, yeah. they're yeah. told they're crazy, it's all a joke. Mm -hmm. We, uh, you know, I kind of held back at the beginning because I thought people are not going to believe me when I tell them about it. And, you know, there was an article in the paper about it. Ha, 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 oh, isn't this funny? And we still have people who are part of the pro-circumcision uh, um, uh, agenda, who think this is the biggest, funniest thing ever, and uh, it's lapped off. It's very hard for men to admit any kind of victimization in this culture. You know, they're not supported. Sex, men are not encouraged. You're, not, you're supposed to be strong at all times, right? So right. God Even as a helpless you. infant. Yeah. Right. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Even as a child, yeah. you know, even as a little baby, like if a little toddler boy falls, people are tend yeah, to say, always. "Get up." Yeah, if a little up. girl falls, they you know want to cuddle her, and it's just, it's very insidious and ugly. And I've just seen it's that raising effective. sons, and it's very yeah. It's a very effective way. We see right, it with exactly. the child sexual abuse, right? Of men, right. which is only starting now to even become discussed because right. it's like God forbid you admit that, you right. know. I mean, exactly. and it's that that happened now suddenly. Yeah. You know, it happens to women too, right? It's like if it happened to you, oh well, now you're tainted, and it's even greater for men. Right. Because like, well, why couldn't you have fought it off somehow? Or you know, yeah. you know, like the little, yeah, the little as boy a, is supposed to have been able to somehow, you know, stop this grown yeah. person from yeah. abusing her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's a challenge of the, and that's why we all need to work together as allies too to support, you know. Men who are in this position, really yeah, what, 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 you're talking about the um, 
European Council, this is groundbreaking to have all of these groups come together in this one document, 47 different countries, passed by a huge margin, I think 70% 70, 70, uh, or more right, voted yes. for it. Um, you know, I, I've sent feelers out to Ayan Hirsi Ali uh, to, uh, um, of course she's got her own foundation and I can understand that um, she's probably pretty busy with that, but I think that's what really it comes down to is all of us working together to create a powerful voice and one that cannot be laughed off, dismissed, or uh, ignored. Yes, um, I just wanted to add, because I was just like thinking, like as a, as like a holistic healer myself, like I try to think, of, like the facts are great, and, and the, you know, but I try to just on a more like holistic perspective, like how to take it. And I just think that this whole talk about like what is the right phallus or what isn't or whatever is like this really reduced view of sexuality. And like it's the small mind that can say like, oh, like, oh, they'll never be able to have good sex if they don't have like these specific genitals. I think is just um I think one thing to take out of it is like regardless of your genitals, like that's not gonna affect or determine whether you have a healthy sexuality or not. Like it's bigger than just penis and vagina. And so just looking at it from just that perspective, it's just like it's so reductive about all this like it has to measure this much, it has to be that or whatever. Um, and just outside of that, just saying like, well, like, no matter what your genitals, it's your sexuality is not necessarily tied to that, you know. And you still have a healthy, normal life. But one of the observations that, that I've made is, in some ways, at least when it comes to infant circumcision and perhaps for intersex genital cutting, it, it's not just about the, the individual's future sex life. It is about a status symbol and adhering to a certain form or ideal. And in, in many ways, in our culture in the U.S., uh, intact men and foreskins are, are ridiculed and made fun of and mocked in popular culture, on television shows, in movies. I just think that's like people's like, so small minded views. Just being male is, is being made to uh, be perceived as being broken or inferior <coughs> or in need of surgical correction immediately after birth. And, and you know, this is one of the reasons that some families you know, seek out this surgery for their child because they want him to fit in and, and reach this, this you know, ideal that this culture has set up for what men are supposed to be. And that's the exact similarity. And I, you know, I think one good way of addressing that is to talk about other situations that you think that the, the person might not feel the same about. Right, like like racism, for example. You know, that's why I love that that doctor made the racism analogy because today, fortunately, um, I think most people would not want to admit that they are racist. You know, I think many people still are, but it's nothing that they're gonna, you know, really be like, well, I'm racist, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna bleach my baby, or you know, like no one would say that, right? Like, you know, I adopted a baby, and I'm gonna. They know enough that even if they're having those thoughts, they know there's something wrong with those thoughts, right? So I like to make a lot of the correlations, you know, because ultimately it's all about, like, ideas of what human beings should be like and what is the ideal way to be born, right? Right? Like, our <coughs> focus is on genitals <coughs> and genital mutilation. But there's so many ways, you know? And then I also think the gentle approach, and you and I were talking about that, uh, one thing I've learned is that I get a lot further by being really gentle and actually supportive. Like I had this great thing where I was asked to be on a show, thank you, and it was actually a lawsuit where the wife was suing the husband because he wouldn't consent to the surgery of their two-month-old. Yeah, she was all freaked out, and, it, and they ruled against the surgery. And, you know, one of the things, fortunately, the, the arbitrator was actually, it was in Spanish, which was awesome. Um, 
Paso Cerrado? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, which, which like, it's all over Latin America, and I didn't, and I'm like, now all my extended family knows. It's not what my exposure, which is, which is cool, you know? People watch that show. Yeah, right? I'm like, whoa, I didn't, you know, I've been getting emails about it, but, but I was, I was horrified because there's an actual real baby here, you know? So this is not just me educating about it randomly. Like, there is an actual real thing here, you know? And it's, it doesn't set precedent. It's not like a court case. But they're supposed to listen to what the arbitrator does. You know, they've agreed legally that whatever she decides, the lawyer... So she was fortunately really knowledgeable, and I could tell right away, you know, that she supported genital autonomy. You know, she supported a child's right to choose. And I was like, thank God. You know, but the mother, with the mother, you know, I was just really gentle. Because, you know, my whole opener was like, you know, I know that this could be really difficult for you. I know that you're worried, you know, I know. And the same approach could be used for circumcision, you know. I know there's so much pressure. This is the way, you know, we've been taught the penises are supposed to look, you know, like... I have found that I've actually been able to turn people around that way a little more because you're right away kind of connecting and supporting them, you know, and where they are emotionally rather than, like, making them, like, well, wait, they're, you know what I mean? They don't want to make them defensive. Right, exactly, because once they're defensive, it's like it's sort of, you start to lose the battle, you know, unless... they're just a debater and they love to do that, <laughs> which few people are, right? Few people will really, like, debate with you and be all defensive and then at the end be like, okay, you're right, actually. <laughs> Forget everything I said. And, right. But, you know, right. so, like, so, yeah, so, anyway, just right. want to throw that yeah. out there. So, so, so that's one of the good things that we do as intactivists. You know, we go to baby fairs, we yeah. go to street fairs, we educate the public who are just walking by, and we say, mm-hmm. do you have any questions? <laughs> what, what would you like to know? And we show them the circumstance, because most people, I have relatives and friends who had their son circumcised, but they refused to go mm-hmm. into the room mm-hmm. while it was done, mm-hmm. because they said they couldn't handle it. Right. So what makes you think that this child can handle it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Really, you're so right. can't handle it as an adult. Well, the parents so, get told like it's much harder for you as a parent than the child. Oh, it's right. much harder right. for you That's as a, a parent. Lie. Yeah, of mm-hmm. course. Oh yeah, they they're lied to all the time. So I always say to people who are on the fence about circumcision, I'm like, one, see one, watch one, mm-hmm. watch one. Mm-hmm. You know, find one on YouTube. Okay or watch Elephant in the Hospital, or watch Circumcision, the Whole Story. They all show an actual circumcision being performed. And then, I want you to realize that 80% of men in the world have foreskins. You know, it's only in America that we do this culturally to our boys. When you have men, so, so many men come, I did the birth fair in San Francisco in, a few months ago. And I'd say 50% of the men who came through our booths having children were intact. That is the highest population of intact men that I've seen in a long time. And a lot of them are from countries where they don't do circumcisions to little boys, to babies. You know, anywhere in Europe, China, Japan, you know, South America, mm-hmm. everywhere but... United States or Canada and even Canada because they dropped it in their medical coverage mm. they've stopped it's down to probably 10 to 20 percent depending on the province yeah so you know that's one of the big ways okay if you don't if you don't believe what I'm saying watch a video Just right. watch one. if you can get through the video and still want to put your child through that Okay. You've got other issues. And and another big thing that's important, the other issues, another big thing that we always have to bear in mind, I don't know if folks remember, we remember the Millman studies that were done in the 60s. And these are the studies where the person was brought into a room and, and sat down in a chair, and there was a series of switches in front of them. And they were told that there was a person on the other side, and they were shown the person, and they put the person on the other side of the room, and they said, you're reading questions to this person, and when they get this wrong, you flip the switch, and the person receives an electric shock. 
and the, the switches from like mild to lethal, and it was all the way up, and the last, the last switch was a big red switch, and it said lethal on it, okay? So the person comes in and says, okay, you have to read these questions. The other person's going to be shot if they get the answer wrong. Almost everyone went all the way up to lethal. Why? Because the person in the white coat told them they had to. Yeah. Yeah. When you read that whole study, you will see that if somebody came in that looked just like the other person, they didn't do it. If, it, if you didn't have a, like an authority, like if there was two people just sitting in the room and then, and then two people it could talk, the, the and two people could talk and go, why are we doing this? Gee, I don't know why. I don't want to do this. And they would leave. They would just stop or just leave the room. But if a person came in with a white coat, or if a person came in with a suit and said, you must do it, you're helping that person, they have to get it right. You can't mess up. You will, you will mess up the test. You will affect our, our the, 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 with the information that, that we're gathering. If that happened, everyone, right up to lethal. So this is something, this is how we educate our children. We have to look at like how we, we process them through in school. We process them the right answer and being cooperative to a way that's pathological. Right. Uh -huh. right? It's pathological. Uh -huh. But that's also part of this. Well, the doctor said. Okay, and yeah. so you know, to it's not just all oh, these stupid, unfeeling parents, but sometimes I think I feel and it makes no, me it's, upset. It's not at all, it's not it's that, that. Oh, it, no. it's part, you know, it's like it, it's the person's <laughs> own wound, and then it's just the way we're taught to be good patients in this culture. Right. Yeah. It's pretty abominable, yeah. And it's that's medical good. worship, you know, mm -hmm. this sort of idea oh, of science right. being the yeah. well, doctor knows stuff. Like, you know, they're human. They go to the bathroom and poop just like, just like everybody else. <laughs> well, that's why I well, gave the, went off topic to give that example about sarcoidosis. It's right. like, you know, so we could just kind of think of it in so many, like not even just with genitals, but things that are just regular, different, right. Right. you know? Yes. Like people, yeah. people are so taught to listen to doctors. Yeah. It, yes. it also goes along with the whole idea of Women are taught that they can't give birth and that they're right. not capable. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. 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 The formula you somehow is better than breast milk. Right. Oh my God. right, and yes. so then that's all handed right there. You don't know what to do with this baby. We do. Just yes. Yeah. Just, just come. Right. Well, you don't know what to do with your own body. You right. actually don't even know your own body. Right. Right. I mean, how many women don't know where their clitoris is? That was a typical We know your body better than you do. Exactly. Exactly. We know what you, we know what's good for you. Right. right. It's, well, it's this yes. religion of science, right? You right. know, this sort of this all hail the science. Science is what's brought us here today and made our lives comfortable and yeah, cures so everything. And so we just blindly accept that scientists, whether they be doctors or anything else, right. know more than we do, and we respect it. Right. You know. Exactly. And even when we the climate, right? oversteps. Right. Yeah. We worship right. science unless we have a god that we worship more than science. Right. 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 Totally. Yeah. Yes. And it's even a disrespect to the common sense of God as, as one who does believe in God. I mean, oh. if God gave a woman two breasts. I guess that must mean the baby must nurse from them. You know, and if a God made an intersex person, like if you're going to say you believe in God, my problem with Christians is that they don't really practice Christianity. Right. No. Right. And if you believe, if you say you believe in God and you say you trust God's will, then and if you have an intersex baby, that means you raise an intersex baby. That's what the judge said, which I loved at the end because the mother's crying when they ruled against the city. You know that she on couldn't. YouTube now. I yeah, I know it's out there, and she's crying. I haven't even watched it yet. I'm like, but I guess I hope I did a good job. I've been told, but you know, she's at the end. The mother's crying. Oh, my baby! And she was just like, look, there's no problem. Just go home and love the baby, love your baby. Right. that you created, that, that you still have, you love right the baby. here. That's healthy, that you know, like God made. She might have used God because she could do that more in Latin culture on TV, right? <laughs> but you know, and hello, all men. Woman. Like, don't you think they came out right? Right. As they were born, yeah. that thing. That's the. There's a reason. There's it's a there. reason the body there's was created. There's a reason. There's a reason. Yes, right. there's a reason for everything. And so many, like, you know, how it was the rite of passage for the <coughs> after the tonsils lobbed out. Right. We don't do that anymore because we right. realize we've wrecked how many people's immune systems. Exactly. Right. I think those analogies, as I'm talking, I'm thinking it would be helpful for us. And maybe you do this on your website. I don't. 
to live to life outdated technology. <coughs> Yeah, just to make people start thinking, yeah, right. like we used to do this, we right. used to do this, you know, yeah. and really s make them start thinking that, yeah. like, yeah, all women used to have a hysterectomy after they went through menopause. Absolutely, that's right. What? It was. It was. Pretty it was, common. It was very common. Pretty right. freaking oh, common. Oh, you're not using you that don't anymore. Need that stuff you? anymore. Right. <laughs> we'll just take it out. Right. Hey. Yeah. We do do that, that, but yeah. continually the argument, and it's the people who don't want to listen. But we've been doing this for thousands of years, yeah, okay. and and you say yes, but you what you know slavery, women not voting. <laughs> oh no, it's it's di it's different because right. it's that's somebody else. Right. Well, we're because we're involved in it, and it's any group uh, that has cultural.